Hi, I'm Dr. Leslie Blankenship-Williams, and in this lecture, we are going to learn about transformation. Transformation is one of three different mechanisms by which bacteria acquire new DNA to become genetic recombinants. So in the previous lecture, I talked about vertical versus horizontal gene flow, and I listed three different ways that bacteria can achieve horizontal gene flow transformation, conjugation, and transduction. This lecture is going to look at transformation. So we're going to start by learning about how transformation was discovered. It turned out, like many scientific discoveries, it was discovered rather serendipitously while the researcher was looking for something else. So the year that this was first identified was 1928, and the man who just identified it was Frederick Griffith. Now Frederick Griffith was working with strains of Streptococcus pneumoniae and Streptococcus pneumoniae is a strain of bacteria that causes a number of different diseases but is probably most famous or well known for causing pneumonia, hence the name. And as he was plating Streptococcus pneumoniae, he noticed that there were two different colony types. Sometimes the colonies would be kind of tight and small and dry looking, and he called those rough colonies. And sometimes they would be larger and they would be more creamy or smooth, and he called those smooth colonies. Now he did not know what accounted for the difference at that point. But as he was doing his experiments, he noticed something really interesting. So if he took or picked a colony from the rough plate and grew it up in some broth and then injected mice with that particular strain or that version of Streptococcus pneumoniae, the mice lived. When he did the same thing with the smooth colonies, so he picked a colony, created a broth of smooth um, Streptococcus pneumoniae, injected it into the mice, the mice basically developed sepsis and died. So clearly, the rough strains did not cause fatal disease, but the smooth strains did. So now, Frederick Griffith performed a third experiment. In this experiment, he took smooth bacteria, grew them up in a broth, and then put that broth under a flame for an extended period of time to kill all of the bacteria. So these are dead streptococcus cells. And then he injected those cells, so I'll put a little X there to denote that these are dead, and then he injected that bacteria dead bacteria into the mice. And what do you think happened? Well, the mice lived because there are no living pathogenic bacteria in that culture. That of course would make sense. For the final experiment, Frederick Griffith did something really interesting. He decided to combine a living set of rough cells with a dead set of smooth cells. Now we know that independently, both the living rough and dead smooth will not cause the mice to die. The mice will survive both of those independently. So you would predict that if you combine both of these, into one test tube, and so now you have a combination and you inject it into the mice, the mice should, of course, survive because it's just dead S cells and living rough cells and both of those are not fatal to the mice. But that's not what happened. The mice died. So when he combined these living rough cells with these dead smooth cells, the mice died. And so he was thinking, well, wow, that's really weird. Independently, the mice live, but I put them together and they die. So then he decided to take some of the blood 
from the dead mice and culture it to see if he could find the bacteria. And sure enough, bacteria grew. But do you know what grew? Smooth colonies grew. What the heck happened? I thought all of the smooth producing bacteria were dead. So Frederick Griffith postulated that somehow the rough bacteria must have transformed into the smooth bacteria by proximity. In other words, by being in close proximity to dead smooth cells, the rough bacteria were somehow able to incorporate their genetics and become smooth themselves and thus cause fatal disease. Well, we now know that the genetic material is DNA. In 1928, that was not known, but it is known now. And we now know that this idea of transformation to transform your genetics, when the bacteria take up DNA from their environment and incorporate it into their genome to be genetic recombinants. So this is my drawing. Let's take a look at the image from your textbook that shows the same experiment. Here we have smooth and we have rough. When the smooth bacteria are injected into the mice, the mice die and you can culture the smooth bacteria. When the rough bacteria are injected into the mice, the mice live and you can culture a few remaining rough bacteria. If you heat kill the smooth variety and inject it into the mice, obviously the bacteria are dead and so what you get out of it is nothing and the mice of course survive, but when you combine um, living rough with heat killed smooth and inject it into the mice, the mice die and what comes out is living smooth. And so again, somehow these living rough cells transformed into the smooth variety. We now know that the difference between rough and smooth is the presence or absence of a capsule. And in a previous lecture, we've learned that capsules have a major advantage in evading a mammal's immune system. So we now know that the difference again was the formation of a capsule and that the rough form did not make capsules, the smooth form did, and by having a capsule that allowed those smooth cells to evade the immune system, continue to replicate, and of course cause fatal disease. So what must have happened is these rough cells somehow got the DNA to make capsules from these degraded smooth cells that were floating around in the same broth, brought them in, and of course became recombinants. In a previous lecture, we learned that genetic recombination could occur with either plasmid, DNA, or a part of a chromosome. Transformation, which is the uptake of naked DNA from the environment, can occur with either plasmid DNA or chromosomal DNA. I want to show you a quick image to show you what chromosomal DNA transformation would look like. So here we have a bacterial cell. And so there's the original chromosome. Here's a piece of DNA that's just floating around nearby in the environment. They somehow get it into their cells and then they decide to switch out some of the new DNA for their old DNA like so. So transformation can happen with a number of different bacterial species. However, it doesn't happen as frequently as you might think. So let's talk for a moment about this idea of what transformation is and under what conditions might bacteria do this. So by definition, transformation is the uptake of naked DNA from the environment. Now, when I say naked DNA from the environment, what I mean is that the DNA is not housed in another cell at this point. So in the case of Frederick Griffith, what happened is, is that the living cells were the rough version, but there was a lot of DNA floating around in that broth from the smooth cells, which were 
were killed and therefore had broken open and their DNA was floating around. And so that's what we mean by the environment, meaning it's not encased in a cell, it's just floating around somewhere in that solution and they can bring it in. Now, transformation involves bringing in DNA, which would be a pretty traumatic experience. The analogy I'm going to give you may not be the best one, but I think it maybe conveys the gravity of the situation. Imagine if I had something about this big that I wanted you to put in your body, and you were going to have to make like a little incision here and rip open your skin and plug it in and then sew it back up. That's not something you're just going to do unless whatever I give you is going to be helpful. So in the same way, trying to create basically an opening large enough to bring in DNA from the environment puts the bacterial cell at some risk. So they are not always willing to do that. In fact, they're rarely willing to do that. Bacteria that are capable of engaging in transformation have a name. They are called competent. So even species that typically can do transformation usually won't. But if they are willing to create an opening and pull in that DNA, we call those type of bacteria competent bacteria. Again, most bacteria are not in a competent state. So what types of environmental conditions might prompt a bacterial cell to become competent and say that it's worth it to create a big old gash in their cell and try to bring in some new DNA, which by the way, chances are, are not gonna be helpful at all. So most DNA that they bring in is not helpful. But like winning the lottery, there's the once in a million shot that you might get the DNA that really is a jackpot, like, oh, DNA for a capsule, for instance. And then suddenly you think, yeah, okay, this was totally worth the risk. So it turns out that transforming invokes considerable risk. Not only are you opening yourself self up and therefore subject to breaking open entirely or lysis, but you're also bringing in DNA that probably is not going to be helpful. So you're only going to do it if you're really, really desperate. So there seems to be two triggers or two criteria that must be met in order for bacteria to transition to a competent state and, and take on that risk of transformation. And one of those is that they have to be very stressed. So going back to Frederick Griffith's experiment, you could imagine that these rough, unprotected streptococcus pneumoniae cells were in the mice, running around the bloodstream, feeling really good, and then the immune system cells come and start munching on them like Pac-Man, and they're all going to die. They're all going to be eaten up. So they realize, you know, bacteria talk to each other. So the bacteria are like, if you have any defenses, put them up now. And they're like, I've got nothing. I don't know. Let's try and pull up DNA from the environment and see what happens. Maybe something. And, you know, a, a cell or maybe two cells got really lucky, pulled up the right DNA for the capsule, started making that capsule, and huh, suddenly they have a huge advantage and can start replicating and producing more identical uh, cells that also produce capsules. So they've got to be stressed, like thinking things are not going well and I might die, so why not? What have I got to lose? And then the other thing is, is that the process of transformation is very temporary. This idea of opening up your cell and bringing in DNA and then closing it again is a very temporary action. If you were to try to open up your cell and just leave it open, it would be like creating a big old gash in your arm and just leaving it open. You would just bleed out and out and out and eventually you would die. So it's a very temporary thing, which means that if DNA isn't nearby, you're basically opening yourself up and closing it and incurring that risk with no DNA coming in. So the other criterion is that there needs to be quite a bit of DNA around. And so the way that bacteria sense that is just density. 
if they're around a lot of other bacteria, chances are some of those bacteria are going to be dead and their DNA is going to be out in the open and they can maybe grab it. So the other criterion is that there needs to be a high density of bacteria. All right, that concludes our coverage of transformation. Our next lecture is going to look at conjugation. Thanks.